So welcome to the Tuesday, March 8th, Byron Hills event Board of Education meeting. Um, I call this meeting to order at 7.12 and um, request a motion that we go into executive session to speak about four items. 2.1 legal matter district, 2.2 contract matter non-represented staff, 2.3 negotiation matter BHTA, and 2.4 negotiation matter CSEA. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right, we'll be back shortly. Okay. We called the meeting to order um, earlier and uh, went to executive session. Now we can stand to say the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. Good to see everyone here. Um, why don't we just um, jump into our business for this evening? We'll start out um, just by asking for a motion to adopt tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right. So next we go to um, any comments from the public regarding any items not on tonight's agenda. Great. Mm -hmm. Hearing none, then we go to the consent. Um, so can I get a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Item six, uh, personnel, seven, special services, and eight, business. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right. Can I pause? You can. For a second because Gina, I don't know. If you're... <gasps> Yay! <laughs> this is Lauren Albert. Hi, Lauren. I don't know if you can hear us or not. Can you hear me? I can hear. Hi, everybody. Hello. So um, something great just happened to Lauren and to Byram Hills. Lauren was just appointed as the new assistant principal at Byram Hills High School. Yeah. yeah, we're excited. We're in your library where you will be watching hundreds of kids. <laughs> <laughs> and we're Thank so happy. I'm very excited to get started and to work with everybody, work with the students, the parents. Families, and I feel very fortunate and blessed to be given the opportunity. So, thank you so much. Oh, great, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats. And Lauren was at Mamaroneck for six years and most recently was an administrator in the Baldwin School District for Social Studies before coming to Byron. Yeah, which is great. All right, welcome, and we're looking forward to seeing you before July 1st, but officially July 1st. All right, thanks Bye. for coming. Congratulations. On, Lauren. Thank you. Bye. 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 That was fast. And, yeah. wow. and I also want to um, make a note that there is a teacher retirement on this agenda too, Mona Goodman. Mm -hmm. And Mona um, and I have worked together in this district for decades. And she brings a, an amazing spark to the classroom and is going to be incredibly missed. You know, that we're fortunate when we're not happy that people retire. Right? It's a, it's a good problem to have. Um, so Mona, we will have many accolades to come and celebrations and a real retirement dinner this year. Um, and just know that um, you're, we're happy for you and proud of you moving forward in your life. And it is Farm Hills Law. Congratulations to you. And that's all I have. That's good. Thanks. So we can go on to the proposed administrator's budget for uh, 2223. So, Kelly, you want to take it away? I think I'm All right. So, I will start um, the finance advisory and the district administrators got together to review and put together this administration's proposed budget for the 22 23 school year. Um, first, we have uh, Lori from our Finance Advisory Committee to that give us the dates. So the first one is in our chat. It was Budget Hearing 1 on January 18th. Oh, no. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tonight is um, the administration's proposed budget. That's March 8th. March 22nd is the Budget Hearing 2 for programs for students with special needs, computer assisted instruction, art and music instruction, and curriculum development. Then on March 29th, we have Budget Hearing 3, April 5th, Budget Hearing 4, April 19th, Budget Adoption, May 3rd, Budget Hearing 5, which reviews the proposed budget, and May 17th, the budget vote at HC Credit Inn from 6.30 in the morning to 9 p.m. And Budget Hearing 2 and 3 are when the public 
and make comments about the budget. All right, Lori, thank you. So starting with our budget guidelines, these pretty much remain the same every year, um, although some of the pieces under it change. So our board goals, our enrollment projections. Uh, today I was informed that we are officially now at 10 sections of kindergarten. Wow. wow. That's right. where we were at when, when our kids started. That's right. great. Yeah, oh, so which is that. pretty amazing. Um, so enrollment is driving a little bit of this budget. Um, although you're not going to see that here because we just learned of, of these additional sections. Um, but really, uh, staffing needs, revenue and expenditure projections are really important for us as we're looking at this. Debt service, you know that we have one bond that is due to come off in 2025. Um, so we do look at that also in a long-range forecast. I'm proud of our facilities and our ability to keep up our facilities. Uh, it prevents us from going out and securing bonds like some other districts need to do for things like improvements to roofs or a boiler. We just had a boiler um, that was unanticipated, but we were able to, between reserve funds and everything else, uh, take care of the work that we need to get done here because we don't allow everything to go to the point that it is in disrepair. Uh, we have a replenishment process. And then um, same with replacing equipment from the district. So our budget uh, proposed is $96,939,312. That's a budget to budget increase of $1.695,768 million. It's 1.78% for a budget to budget increase. Um, a few things that we look at um, when we are doing that budget is we have to, of course, analyze student needs. We have to look at programs that we currently have. Byram Hills has been creating great programs for kids over the years and we want to maintain those programs for these kids. Um, our enrollment is is going to give us even better opportunities to do that. Uh, we look at all of our contractual obligations, salaries, um, staffing, and as I said enrollment, um, and then also looking at our reserve funds and how much of those reserve funds we might need to tap into in each year. You never want to use your reserve funds for an operating budget. Um, so we are trying to be really clear of using them in that way. And next, the vision. Now this is from my predecessor, Bill Donahue, who I'm pretty sure is not watching the Barnum House Board of <laughs> Education meetings. But, um, Every student K-11 will have the opportunities afforded our graduating seniors. I keep that here because I always want to do more than that. And I know that our kids right now, whether they're in kindergarten or they're in 12th grade, have more opportunities than the kids who were there 12 years before. So right now when I'm looking at some of our seniors doing podcasting classes, when I'm looking at us piloting a startup entrepreneurship program at the high school, when I'm looking at Global Scholars, you know, kids 10 years ago did not have that opportunity. So we really want to make sure that the opportunities that we give are not just flashy, fantastic opportunities, but that they will carry these students forward to the changes in their lives. Like science research, for example, it is still a very strong program here. It wasn't just something flashy. We weren't chasing after shiny objects. It's something that we thought every child would benefit from from delving deeply into the scientific field, for presenting their material, defending their material, putting together their arguments, finding factual information. That's a skill that's going to serve them for all time. So we hope that our other programs do just that as well. And here we have our podcasting on the right, our kids playing music on the left. Um, and you can find all of our programs on the website under curriculum and instruction and academic departments. And now, this is pretty funny, but at the time that the demographer was here, this was our enrollment, and we were anticipating 2,333 students in 2022-23. And as I just told you, we had two additional sections of kindergarten already. So uh, we are anticipating that that number is going to be easily 40 um, above what is here, if not more for other children who will be coming in at each grade level. Demographer did a great job at the time with what they were given, but we know that there have been so many home sales in Byram Hills, um, which I think is a great thing, right? People want to move here and send their children to school here. Um, testament to our, to our um, employees and our community. And then the next one, enrollment by building. 
you'll start to see, although this isn't really accurate, because at the 560 that you're seeing right now at Coleman Hill, um, it is going to be 600 <laughs> at Coleman Hill right now. So these numbers are big, number. are big numbers and due to change. Um, remember when these kids, when we used to have 10 sections at the middle school and the high school, we used to have a team that was half on 7th grade, half on 8th grade. <coughs> And when our enrollment went down, we got rid of that entire team of four teachers, math, science, social studies, and English. And these groups are telling us that at some point when they hit that middle school grade again, we're likely going to be looking at adding teams again, uh, provided those numbers stay that way. I think it proves one thing, which is that if you look at the demographer's report like from five years ago, yeah. you never want to put too much stock in the demographer's report. Right. And we always said that there's the same amount of housing stock here, if not slightly more every year. So eventually, yeah. these houses are going to turn, turn over. over. Yeah. And at the time, in demographer's defense, at the time that they do some of this forecasting, these kids aren't even born yet, these little five-year-olds. Right? And who could have predicted the pandemic? And exactly. And who's that, gonna well, be that's here? It's so many factors. They do the best yeah. they can. With they do. Out. They do a good job. Yeah, usually they're pretty accurate. Yep. And so when we focus on staff resources, on the next slide, um, we have elementary teacher, but that's going to go up by two teachers, and elementary special education teacher. We're going to have a new special education program, um, a special class at Coleman Hill, which I'm really excited about. That's an opportunity for our students who are in district and also for um, students to tuition in for that program. And um, an increase in science, an increase in special education, and an increase in math at the high school level. Um, and that is due to um, needs that we've had. And we had a, a leave replacement we have to turn into a full-time position. So what does the proposed budget include? Um, all of the mandated stuff. But what I really love to see is our kids, at the end of the day, going to play rehearsal, going to their extracurricular clubs, going to debate, um, going to practice for the pit for a musical, going to jazz band, going to their extracurricular athletics, um, and it supports all of those programs. I think that the more that we can have students engage in the school that they are a part of, they feel like a part of a community here, and that should be our main goal to develop for them. Um, they shouldn't feel like numbers. They should feel like they're participants, right? And um, all transportation services remain. And then I will turn it over to Kelly for component analysis. So every school district is, is required to do a budget based on <coughs> three components, program, capital, and administrative. Now, the majority of your, of your school district is the program budget. That's essentially everybody involved in basically instruction or everybody that, that meet with, meets with or has interaction with children. For the most part, it's a good way of thinking about it. That's your teachers, your aides, your bus drivers, your librarians, psychologists, social workers. Uh, that's your program budget. And that's 72.3% uh, this year. It's a little lower than last year uh, by about 0.1%. Uh, um, last year it was 72.2, a little increase this year. Capital last year was 16.1, so that kind of shift between capital to program, uh, basically because our debt service is going down. That's why that shift, you'll see if you look back at the slide last year. Uh, speaking of capital, that's 16% um, down from last year, again, about that 16.1 last year. That's your custodial maintenance staff, uh, your security, your debt service, uh, your insurance, um, and purchases of bus vehicles. So we do a replacement of our bus vehicles on a yearly basis based on a useful life. So that's everything in, that's in the capital component. And finally, administrative, that's uh, all your supervisory staff, your, your district office, your principals, your APs, directors, uh, chair people. Uh, your legal counseling, your auditing, um, uh, and then both these administrative costs as well. So uh, that's the, the whole component of a budget, your program, your capital administrative. I'm going to go oh, click on this like you can see. Uh, just uh, some detail about each budget. Uh, I'm just going to just kind of talk about some areas of each one, uh, just give you guys some idea. But if you have a question, please, uh, please feel free to, to ask. Um, I'll take a, just take a look at the special ed uh, section here, the, the students with uh, disabilities in uh, OCK ed. An increase of almost 4%. Um, last year, if you looked at this last year, we were down, it was a negative 2%. It really depends on students that come in on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, we have about three to four additional students that are, are, are being placed uh, out of district next year, so that, that's, uh, that's where that increase is, almost 4%. And special ed kind of goes ups and, ups and down depending on when the students come in, students age out. Uh, moving to the district. Um, so this year uh, it is increasing, and last year was it negative um, in terms of special ed. 
Uh, our computer, you see a reduction there of 1.6%, the computer assisted instruction. Uh, again, there was an increase last year. Uh, this year we're seeing a reduction. Um, we made a significant amount of purchases in terms of technology last year uh, and the year before based on, on what the needs, obviously, of everything going on. Um, so this year we're seeing a decrease of 1.6% in technology. Uh, you'll notice uh, social worker decrease of almost 50%. In the prior budget, we had allocation for a position. Uh, we actually, and if you look at guidance, you'll see that increase of 5.5. They kind of team together. We used the uh, student assistance uh, services uh, for that position. We didn't fill it uh, uh, that it was a full position. We used them, and we're going to use them again next year. Uh, so we'll have a full uh, five days at Coleman Hill for that position and a one day at the high school next year. So those two kind of team together in terms of the decrease in social worker services and the increase in guidance. Was the increase but, in guidance because we had a K-12 mandate? Didn't we have it, was that something new? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, uh, so overall, in terms of, of the budget, it's a 1.9% increase in the program uh, section of the budget. Again, it's 72.3%. In terms of capital, um, again, this is really everything that kind of associates with building and maintenance of our buildings. Um, You'll see uh, operation uh, of the plan, you'll see an increase of 3%. That's mainly attributed to our increases in utilities, um, specifically ele electric costs. Uh, we're, we're projected a 14% increase in our electric costs next year uh, based on our electric provider. Uh, they notified us uh, earlier this year of that. You may be experienced that at home as well, uh, increased in electric rates in this area specifically. Uh, maintenance, uh, an increase of uh, almost 6%. You know, we've installed a lot of, of new equipment in our buildings, ACs, exhaust units, uh, you know, in order to just properly maintain those on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, we've increased that line. You know, we want to get it the most we can out of those uh, equipment that we've installed, so maintaining them on a year-to-year -year basis is definitely crucial to make sure they, they last for their useful life and beyond, if possible. Uh, security, you'll see a decrease in security. Not that we're making a reduction in terms of guards. Uh, Prior year, we did a lot of installation of cameras in our buildings, so we've reduced that budget code um, from from what it was the prior year. Just reduced that. That that's that almost six percent decrease uh, in terms of security. No change in our guards or our facilities that way. SROs. That's only a decrease of the camera line uh, for BOSIS. And then finally, transportation. You see an increase of, of nine point one percent with our, our fleet replace, replacement plan. Uh, it's an additional uh, van. We usually, depending on the year, depending on the, uh, the useful life of the vehicles, um, it's usually a bu like two buses in a van or three vans in a bus. It just kind of depends on the years of the vehicles. This year we have an additional van, so we're actually replacing three buses in a van for next year. So that's why that's an additional nine. Uh, so, so I could just talk about that for a second. I sure. guess we don't know for sure what this legislation, what the final version is going to look yes. like, or even if it's going to pass. But assuming it does and we know on April 1st what it looks like, I and mean, how might that influence our desire to buy these vehicles? Um, how, you know, how, how much lead time so, do we have before? So we, the useful life of the vehicle is between 12 and 15 years. So we, we have an additional next year and basically year after where we would still purchase the vehicles we're purchasing now uh, if that legislation goes through. So if we purchase, we purchase these, bus, these buses next year, by the time they end the useful life, it would be that requirement before the requirement. Before the requirement, so we're going to get the yeah. full useful life out of them before. Yes, the it would be for this year and next year if the dates. If that's and we same. couldn't order them now because we don't have the infrastructure. There's, we don't so, have the there's so much. We don't know I, what to do with these. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, discussions yeah. we've had on the vehicles between the business officials and, and, and the various groups. Uh, just you know, there's a lot of issues that still need to kind of get ironed out, and the cost is one of them. I mean, they're basically double the price of a, of a current. Oh cost. no, I I totally get it, and 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 we have. I mean, we've been trying to be as vocal as we can be yeah. to all our local legislators delegation that there are a lot of good intentions but in practice yes. right now as it stands there are a lot of issues with the way the legislation has been constructed so especially that school districts who own their own fleet are not eligible for these grants exactly yes. right exactly and, and I know that Pete Harcum knows that Shelley Mayer knows that right and, and our buses are uh, low emissions if, uh, you know we, we purchase buses based on uh, what's a diesel uh, remember the name of it it's a look it's a TSI or something. Yeah, it, it has an animal component to it, the diesel, that uh, it's a very low emission. Uh, what? So, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't even <laughs> say that. Do you remember what it's called? I, I, just, it's I don't know what it's called, but I know what it is. Yeah, there's, there's a component, some kind of cow component that lowers the emission. Like a manure level. component? Yeah, it's something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. For your yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 It's like a mild. Yeah, it's like a mild. Yes, I say the word out loud. 
Yeah. Could we get grandfathered? Do you think we'd get grandfathered in? I think it's going to depend. I mean, we're, I think we're really early. This is my personal opinion. I think we're really early in the technology. I don't think we're quite there where everybody can have it. Honestly, if everybody wanted to do it, they wouldn't be able to produce enough to actually get to do it. There's not. You know, three companies Bluebird, are there? Three? Yeah, there's three companies. And, you know, it's not your big bus pickups, it's not your Bluebirds and, and your, and your um, the other one. It's not. It's just companies that are starting this process. The technology is not quite there yet. I understand the need for it, um, but. We're almost there. I think that's why they gave the lead time that they did. Um, right. We just don't want to be buying vehicles that aren't going to be able to be used for their useful life. Yep. That's so, so we got two also, years. There are also companies like there's a company in Long Island that takes your regular bus, your your diesel bus, and it turns it into an electric bus yeah, for think, less money. Or I, I think it might on. get to that. I think that's more realistic, just yeah. based on supply. If they needed, I mean, I think the, I think the webinar said they had 700 bus school buses. Um, in like three counties. So uh, replacing 700 buses it would be impossible. Um, you know, we have trouble getting regular buses now. You know, we order our buses that when the budget vote ends that we usually don't get those until October, November for lucky, you know, based on supply issues this year, we didn't, we didn't get them until January. So that's my only concern with it. So hope I answered your question. Uh, and then finally, administrative uh, portion of the budget, this is a 1.4% increase um, I just call your attention to the programs with, with students uh, for, uh, with disabilities. That's a decrease of 6.2%. That's based on a change in uh, administration, retirement administration, and filling that position. So overall, uh, administrative going up 1.4%, and that's 11.7% of our total budget. Sadly, this, this slide hasn't changed in many years. Uh, our budget drivers, uh, really, we have no uh, way of... of, of I keep thinking this is my thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, fortunately, this year the, the teachers' retirement system did not have a large increase. Um, so, retirement systems is for every dollar paid a teacher, there's a percentage that the district has to pay towards their retirement. Last year it was 9.53%. So, every dollar we give nine cents, basically. Um, so, for, from this year, it's going from 9.53 to a range of 10 to 10 and a half. So, we'll probably be in that 10 and a quarter range. Uh, which is really not a large increase as it's been in prior practice. Luckily, the employee's retirement system, which essentially is everybody that's not a teacher or administrator or uh, instructional, uh, that actually went down this year. It's been flat for the last two years. It was at 14.6% last year uh, and this year. And next year, it's going down to 11.6%. So we're seeing a reduction in the, in, the, in the employee's retirement system. And, and it's a concern. Retirement system is a concern on a yearly basis. If you remember five, six years ago, there was a huge shift in the cost for retirement, and it caused us a lot of layoffs uh, in, in New York State. So it's something we're always looking into. I do anticipate that going up next year, possibly the year after that. Hopefully it's not a huge jump uh, where it would be a, a larger discussion. But uh, that's something, you know, is a concern on a yearly basis. So based on, is it based on a three-year average or a five-year average? It's based on a three-year average, uh, allegedly. So there's a little bit of a lag. If we go into a recession, it takes yes. a little bit of time for it to catch up. Hopefully, but yeah, they tend to plan a little advanced. Um, I'm encouraged it's not a huge increase this year, but I, I do, it is a concern going forward uh, in terms of retirement. Contractual costs are our salary and our, our, and our health insurance. Uh, fortunately, our health insurance only went up 1.5% this year. Uh, speaking with other business officials in the area, in, in Orange County and Putnam, uh, the state plan, the nice ship plan, went up 10% this year. Large increase for nice ship, uh, and they're usually on par with Swiss Ship, our, our current, our company, our uh, plan, or a little lower sometimes. Um, and the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES plan went up eight percent. I know the Orange Orange Holster plan went up seven percent. So, uh, very fortunate that our plan Swiss Ship uh, only raised their rates one point four percent. Again, health insurance is a big portion of our of our budget and our expenses. So it's, it's definitely encouraging. I do think that's going to increase going forward. I mean, the uncertainty out there, obviously, we don't know. Um, but I can't imagine it go 1.5% again next year, so we're probably looking at an increase there. And then finally, Medicare. Uh, a 14% uh, projected increase in Medicare next year uh, based on the rates that were, were, were out there. So that's something to keep an eye on. That's the largest increase I can ever remember. Um, so definitely something to keep an eye on going forward, uh, the increases for Medicare. This has changed a little bit. You know, this is a good thing. I, We've removed a lot of uh, issues in terms of, uh, usually we're talking about uh, when the governor does their budget and they, they talk about changes to uh, expense aids, changes to BOCES aids and any reductions. Uh, fortunately, uh, the legislature and the government uh, really pushed out uh, the, the issue with foundation aids, so you don't see that on here. 
Uh, a lot of districts in this area received the money that, from foundation aid that they were due back uh, since since it started, since GEA started, the gap elimination. So you'll see a lot of districts there receiving a lot of foundation aid, maybe not as much in this area, but more towards uh, Putnam and uh, a little farther out in Westchester, you'll see that they received a lot of foundation aid. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, are, we were not at that same portion. Uh, we were not uh, due any money. Uh, we were pretty much on, on par. Um, but there is no negative. They're not taking money back from us, fortunately. Uh, we're hold harmless, um, and we are receiving a 3%, a minimum 3% increase in state aid uh, based on foundation aid, which is about $63,000, uh, which is close to what we've received on a yearly basis in terms of increase. Um, but really, there hasn't been a lot of uh, mandate relief. We still have the same kind of mandates going forward. I know there's a lot of legislation right now um, to try to relieve some of those issues. Um, but again, I'll, just, I'll keep that on there as something to discuss. And again, the federal tax law still, still out there, uh, and no change on that. Hopefully, something goes that way. That's obviously something that's hurt this area significantly. So that's another issue of concern going forward. I like that the list is starting to, to slow down, but uh, there's still things uh, work to be done. So in terms of the expenses we talked about tonight, the, the revenue side of the budget will, will be on the March 29th. We have another meeting on the 22nd. Uh, we talking with the finance advisory. I have a meeting with the finance advisory committee and discussing um, the state aid going a little further into that, the tax levy, and then uh, where we are in terms of equalization rates. Uh, we'll talk about the shift and the, and the share of the tax levy from each town uh, like we do every year. And we'll have that discussion on 29th. I'll give you a lot more detail in terms of the changes in assessed value in each town. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little further um, on the 29th. But it's definitely worth reiterating because I mean, there are there have been articles um, in in the press about like significant amounts of state aid increase yes. for some districts yes. in our region broadly and and to your point unfortunately that is not you know true for our district and state aid is what three four percent of our budget roughly right. maybe four so it's a very small percentage to begin with and it's not increasing other than the base three percent rate so it puts us at a bit of a of a disadvantage as it relates to um, state funds, but it is what it is, and that's something that is formulaic, and we don't have you know year-to-year -year control over, and right. and so you know we do rely on property taxes for the vast majority of our of our budget. Absolutely. Uh, and then our next uh, budget presentation was on uh, March 22nd, so two weeks. Uh, we'll be discussing programs with students with special needs, computer assisted instruction, art and music instruction, and curriculum development. And then uh, our budget hearing three on March 29th, uh, budget hearing four will be our final proposed budget on April 5th. April 19th will be our budget adoption, May 3rd our final budget hearing, and then the budget vote on May 17th. And if you have any, uh, this presentation will be on the website tomorrow, but if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at uh, my email there, or just uh, check the website for further information. And Kelly and I will do our budget presentations at board at uh, principal's, principal's coffees coming up. Thank Great. you. Thank so you. Much. Any questions? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, appreciate it, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for your work. All right. So that brings us to 10.1 unfinished <clears throat> business. Discuss uh, on board of education candidates. Okay. So. Um, I think even though I know our candidates have heard this multiple times now, just for the sake of anybody tuning in to this meeting that may not have seen some of the previous meetings, I'll just quickly recap the process around our vacant Board of Education seat, which started way back in December um, when Ira Shulman had become town judge. And ultimately, um, at the January meeting, we accepted his um, resignation for his board seat. And that left a vacant seat on our board. And the board had a discussion at the initially the December meeting just alerting the public to this, but then ultimately when it became official at the January meeting, trying to figure out how we were going to move forward. And you know, there was a consensus reached that we would attempt to appoint someone to the seat between the time at which we make the appointment through the date of the election. And it's important for the community to know that, that on election day, at that point, once the you know, results are ratified, then um, whoever the community chooses in the election process would be you know, sworn in at that point for the seat. Um, but nevertheless, it's important um, to you know, attempt to try to appoint someone to the seat, given you know, that it's open right now. So what we did was, once we made that you know, clear to the public that it was an opportunity, we asked for anybody to step forward and gave a window of it was roughly 10 days. 
And uh, we had three candidates step forward. One candidate um, was disqualified because they weren't a um, voter in the district, so they weren't able to serve on the board. Um, but we had two um, great candidates, um, community members, who did come forward. And then we asked them to submit um, answers to some questions and their resume, um, which we appreciate you know, their work on that. And then had them come join us at, it was February 16th, when we held a public meeting where each candidate made a statement. And then ultimately we had an opportunity to ask um, questions and to you know, really get to know the candidates and, and their backgrounds and what they can bring to the board better. Um, I want to you know, give a personal thank you to both of you, to Gwen and to Melissa, for coming forward. because to it's really not only a brave thing to do, but also it's just so important for um, this community. And um, we just appreciate all of your work that you put into this process, all of your efforts um, in the past, um, your volunteers into the district. And um, we just couldn't thank you enough for both coming forward. And so at this point, I would really ask just for a discussion of the board. The way that it works is that in order to appoint a seat, we have to have um, four board members agree on a candidate. And if it is split and there aren't uh, four board members that agree, then the board, then the seat just goes vacant um, through May. But if there are four members, um, then we would anticipate asking for a motion to take a vote, and then um, we would swear in the candidate at the very end of the meeting tonight. Um, so it's a bit of an awkward process because it's all in public, and we recognize that. Um, but it's also the way it should be because it's a public board, and, and we want to do this, you know, in a transparent and and correct way. So with that, I would just um, ask for anybody that has um, a view to to share. I, I, I can go first. Um, first of all, I echo everything that Scott just said, and I thank you both so much for, for being here and being interested. To me, both, both candidates are very, very impressive, and their dedication to our district is evident. Both candidates, to me, would also be extremely accretive to the board, and they both bring obvious passion and years of experience. With that said, the next two months, between now and May 17th, will be a very quick two months as we dive deeper into the budget. And the term obviously starts uh, today if uh, someone's appointed and ends May 17th, which is you know clear to, uh, to, to both candidates. I personally feel that Melissa's years of experience on the Byron Hills Education Foundation, and especially her multiple years of experience as an executive on the foundation, and four of the six of us board members now were on the foundation, three of us in executive positions. I think that or those experiences would allow Melissa to hit the ground running in this, what is a very truncated term, and I think that's important. Uh, moreover, Melissa's involvement with Challenge Success and site-based teams at various schools over the years, I think gives her an important insight into the curriculum and a hands-on working relationship with our principals and administrators. Now, although these factors clearly are not prerequisites, again, because of the truncated term over the next eight to 10 weeks, I think these factors uh, undoubtedly, in my mind, put Melissa in a very solid position. And for these reasons, I feel that although both candidates are really outstanding, I think Melissa would be the candidate that I would support to be appointed. Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, also, same. I want to thank both of you for for coming and uh, for your time, and dedication, and thoughtful participation um, in the process. So thank you both to Gwen and Melissa. Um, both candidates. I'm going to sort of say a little bit of echo what what you said, Jason. Bring a, a myriad of experience um, to the position. Both being early childhood special education teachers, educators. Um, uh, active members of the community, um, within the community and within the district itself, uh, having done multiple things in, in full of different schools. Um, however, the candidate that I'm supporting this evening um, is as well as Melissa as well, Melissa Jacobs. I believe her six years of service on the BAGF, um, the, the site-based support teams, um, you know, the uh, challenge success committee work that you've done will also assist with an easy transition for this short interim board seat. So, um, I, you know, again, thank you both. And I both, you know, are excellent candidates. But um, Melissa has my support this evening. 
So I'll go next. Sure. Going on the table. Um, I'm going to try not to repeat what everybody's saying, just in the interest of time. Uh, thank you, thank you both. I think we can't we can't go wrong with either of you. Both wonderful, are wonderful candidates. Um, my support tonight is for Gwen. I feel that she is um, thoughtful and passionate, and her experience um, brings a different type of experience to the board and would uh, would enhance our the diversity on the board. Uh, this is really a difficult decision. Uh, you, you both are just amazing, wonderful, contributing people to the community and to the environmental school district. Um, I've directly and indirectly worked with you over the past several years from my various roles on the PTSA. Um, and and those, your commitment to the children and the school district is there's no words for your um, your love and joy for the kids in the district. Um, in looking at the uh, short term, from you, you're both you're both educators. You both have incredible backgrounds, but just looking in the short term from an administrator standpoint, um, I believe that Melissa's experience with the Education Parent Foundation may help us transition over these next uh, six to eight weeks. That's not to say that Gwen, that you would not be an incredible candidate for uh, uh, for the Board of Education, and I certainly encourage you to pursue it, but for this immediate need right now in the short term, uh, I would say Melissa is uh, just with her background with the Education Foundation a little more suited for the short term period. Both candidates I thought were stellar, but on the margin based on the in-district experience and contemplating preparing for the position through various volunteer and very time consuming positions in the district and constant interest in the workings of the district. I'm going to support Melissa tonight. And I just again want to thank um, both of you for coming forward and I think it's it's amazing that we have two candidates that are that have an education background and so truly understand education and are passionate about education and passionate about the district and you've both you know volunteered so much of your time for the district I also um, am prepared to support Melissa tonight and, and it's specifically because of the experience that she had and the combination of the executive role and the BHEF um, for you know, a, a significant number of years, including the grant review committee, um, really you know getting deeper into you know, curriculum in the district, in addition to the site-based um, experience and challenge success. And I think it's really those three things that um, that will enable you to get up to speed quickly on the task, because typically you have a little bit more latitude to um, you know to get up to speed when you join the board of ed. But it's such a compressed period of time um, that I feel like your your experience is just really well suited to get up to speed quickly. So I, I think with that, I um, would ask for a motion because um, I think we have consensus to appoint Melissa. So moved. Second. All in favor? Um, all not, or all uh, against? Or okay, fair enough. So um, motion carries, but I, I think it's with uh, it's with a heavy heart because I think um, we have two great candidates, and and I hope when that um, you continue to you. Know, work with us in lots of different capacities because what you've added to the district through the years is is very admirable and I think we all I can speak personally I enjoy getting to know you in this process um, and getting to know both of you and your experience and so um, thank not you. an easy process but um, but, but yeah, thank you and, to you both. And I agree because you have to hit the ground running the next few weeks so it's congratulations and thank you. Yeah. It'll be good for our kids in the district. So yeah. thank it's you. Nice to get to know. That's very thank gracious. You. <laughs> yeah. We are, we are blessed to be in this community. So thank you both. Yeah. So we'll so we'll amend the agenda and come back at the very end before we adjourn just to um, administer the oath. Um, so anybody else have any comments or take a break? Take a break. Yeah, we could, break. yeah, we'll take a couple yeah. minute break. Yep, and then we'll come back and we'll do policies. Oh, point two. Mm -hmm. Who's kicking it off for policy? Is it? All right. Tim, are you going to kick it off? I will, yes, okay, I will kick cool. it off and send it over to you in a moment. We have um, a few policies for second read that we reviewed 
at the last meeting. There's policy 0000, and we'll throw that over to the policy committee in a moment. Um, the citizens' advisory. And you know, let's see. Uh, we have um, child abuse, mistreatment, and neglect, and domestic setting. Right. So those are uh, for a second read, and we did answer some questions on those at the last meeting. Um, and then for, I guess I'll kick it over to the policy committee. We also um, have a second read the educational philosophy and mission statement. And well, that's the policy committee of Lara, Mia, and Petri to have a discussion regarding that policy. So at, at our last meeting, we, we discussed the um, educational uh, philosophy and mission statement, and there were some concerns and questions about it. And um, it's up for a second read this evening. And we included suggestions from the last meeting into this revised policy, if you had a, a chance to look it over, including leadership, wellness, character education, um, principles, and learning disposition. So um, we want to like to ask the board if you feel this policy now captures our educational philosophy and uh, if you have ed or recommend any additional edits uh, for this second read this evening. I really like the addition of the yeah. leadership. That was a great suggestion. Yeah, that, was, that was what we spent a lot of time on. Yep, um, I feel the same way. Thank you. We're all good with that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yeah, excited about that addition to the mission statement. So we will update the website as well. And then we have a few policies for first read. There's um, policy 4000, student learning standards and instructional guidelines. And this policy was written in 2006 and has not been updated. So it was rewritten to uh, focus on the current areas in curriculum and instruction that are our priorities. And um, you know, some things include mentioning the New York State learning standards, national standards, higher level thinking skills, and learning dispositions. And those were all integrated into the um, instructional guidelines. And then there is policy 4200, which is curriculum management. And that also was written in 2006, so it has not been updated in a while. Uh, there's four main sections to this. The first section is around curriculum development, which provides the guidelines on our approach to developing the local curriculum. And just to clarify for our community who might not understand is that the state sets standards for each of the content areas and then local districts have uh, the authority to write and develop their own local curriculum. Um, the second section is the adoption and setting uh, some areas around how the curriculum is adopted and that is the Board of Education's responsibility to adopt curriculum and curriculum materials. Then there's curriculum implementation, which describes the responsibilities for implementing curriculum and instruction in our schools and making sure that what we adopt and what we write as our local curriculum is actually being taught and implemented in the classroom. So it describes that process. And then the fourth section is the curriculum review process. And as you know, we present frequently some uh, highlights on our curriculum so the board and our community has a chance to see our programs and I also occasionally present some review of our programs and also when we look at our assessment data, that is uh, a part of the review process as well. And then Gina? Sure. Um, I think this is the last one for us, right? Yes. Um, and the last policy is entitled Student Health Services. That's policy 5420. Um, this policy was just revised and updated in January 2021. It outlines our responsibilities in terms of um, ensuring that our students are both learning in a safe and helpful environment. Some of the topics that are included in this policy speak to the annual physical exam requirements and screenings that our school nurses are required to do. It also speaks to the student health records of all our students that are enrolled here, as well as uh, privacy for those records and how we store them. Also speaks to immunizations, which I'll touch upon in a moment our emergency treatment for any medical situations that occur on campus, as well as how we administer medication and how we respond to uh, significant medical um, incidents such as anaphylactic shock, possible overdose, etc. So the one change, it's minor, that we, that the reason we're bringing this back to the table is under immunizations prior to tonight or to reviewing this policy, we had listed every vaccination that was required for New York State for students to enroll in our schools. And in looking at that, um, we felt it was better suited to uh, inform parents and guardians of bring their attention right to the New York State Department website, which indicates which vaccinations are required and when. Our policy really didn't, at the, our, for, the former um, 
policy really didn't include the actual timing of those particular vaccinations that are required. So in the essence of keeping with what uh, possibly could change or um, what is required for pre-K as opposed to kindergarten, uh, we felt it was best suited to ensure that parents just reference that website and document. Okay. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any questions on these policies. All three are a first read, correct? Um, I thought the um, the one that Lara and yeah, that's the second read. I mean, the, 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 the three that are first yeah. reads. Four thousand forty three hundred and fifty four twenty are first reads. Um, as far as immunizations, um, something that didn't occur to me when we had our policy meeting, but just came to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps I'm not reading thoroughly through. Do we list any kind of exceptions, religious or health related? So that actually was revised. Um, if you look on, let me just find it for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that also on the website? Yeah, so uh, it, it is. And also, um, if you just look right below in that second paragraph um, where it says regarding medical exemptions and the process that is required um, mm -hmm. and how it has to be reissued annually, it's right at the top of the page. I guess the second page of the policy. Second, okay, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I missed that. I'm, I apologize. No, that's okay. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Clear. Any other questions about any of them? No. All right. Um, thank you. So, so if not, I'd ask for an approval of the second read of 0000. zero, zero, zero. 2260 and 5460, and then the first read on 4,200 and 5420. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Thanks to the work of the policy committee. Thank you. There's a lot of work. So next we go to ah, the New York State Report Card. New York State Report Card. <laughs> so, uh, not, not quite as dramatic as, as it used to be. Uh, they no. used to release it all at once, and now they release it in parts. So. Um, there's a few new parts of the released New York State report card, which is the accountability status, uh, the enrollment data, and the English language learner data. And this is data from 2020-2021 school year. Um, the accountability status is what we would expect. We're in good standing in all of the uh, areas and all of the demographic groups as well. And uh, this accountability is um, mandated by the Every Student Succeeds Act, the federal legislation. Um, the enrollment data doesn't provide any surprises, and there's the English language learner data as well that gives demographic breakdown on our um, English language learner population. The other two reports I put into your packet are the three through eight test data, which is not new to you. You uh, heard me present that data back in the fall. Um, so everything is what we would expect. The one thing you might notice under the accountability data is the absenteeism. It might be a bit higher for those listed as chronic absenteeism. Uh, that's due to the pandemic and quarantines. Um, you saw that across the state where more students were noted as chronically absent, which is missing 10% of school, um, but nothing to surprise us um, in the data other than that. So pretty unremarkable, but that's how we'd like the <laughs> New York State report card to be. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think you just need to accept it, Scott, or uh, vote on this. Uh -huh. Okay. Kind of leave. Um, and any by the way, just brings up the state tests, I guess. Yes. Um, anything? Yeah, I'm going to present a little bit in my staff report on that, so I'll give an update okay. on state All right, tests. sounds good. So um, I yeah. would ask for um, an acceptance of the New York State report card for 2021 22. So moved. Is that good? Yep, we have to, we have to accept it. Yep. Um, yes. All in favor? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I don't accept yeah. <laughs> I don't well, there, you, you never know. Accept it. I mean, we can find yeah. out. Do you do each individual <laughs> school? I'm sorry? They do this for each individual staff. Yeah, right. Yeah. The report cards. They do break it down by schools, yes. Not the best data. Okay, so we go to superintendent report. Superintendent's report. Oh, Tim? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent report. We did? Yeah. yeah. Um, Multitasking. Kelly has a clicker, Jen. So oh, okay. Hey, so quick. Yourself. Slide 231 on the dock. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So I want to see, I'm going to give the board a little test. What is different <laughs> about this agenda 
than other agendas that I've had for the past two years mm -hmm. since this past mm -hmm. Monday. Mascot. Mascot. Well, <laughs> COVID is number three, right? So I'm happy to say that we have more to report on than just COVID. So we're going to start with Parent Square notification system, um, a new notification system we're going to be adopting that I just want to sort of brief you on. Facilities work at the high school in Crittenden that's going on right now. Our COVID numbers, which are very small, and how mask optional has been going in the community, school community. And last but not least, my favorite student highlights all the time. So Parent Square notification system is something that we are going to be adopting. You don't get to see me sweat when I am trying at <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning to send out a Blackboard Connect blast, and it's circling. It's circling. <laughs> and we're all calling Blackboard. Uh, let me give you a ticket number. You are number eight nine. No wait, it's seven eight nine. This is literally what we're going through. Um, times where Blackboard and it's not going to be supported anymore. But quite frankly, it's not really supported right now. Um, so we need to move to a two pa new Parent Square notification system. Um, it allows for phone, email, text. There's a great app that can go on a parent's phone. It can give you push notifications. It can sync with calendars. Um, it has a lot of features um, that we can roll out over time, even like student teacher rollout, but that would be much farther down the road. Uh, but it, it's a great option. Eventually, you could even be have forms that are submitted through this so it can be the, the housing of all things communication mm -hmm. for Byron Hills. Um, it'll push things out to our social media accounts, so really just connecting on a platform. And people don't have to opt in, they ju it's just going to be automatic. Right? So we do, well, just like Blackboard Connect, you, you can decide not to opt in like that and you'll only get your emails sent to you. Um, but parents will opt into that. We're going to send it to them. We also have the added functions. Um, like right now, if you're a divorced family and you want a step-parent, to be notified as well that we can include more people on this, whereas Blackboard really wasn't amenable to that. So we have a whole rollout. Andrew Taylor is doing this um, with Krista Castelli in our tech department, and they have a whole rollout of when the admin are going to be trained, um, when they're going to issue things out to faculty and staff, when they're, you can see all the parent training um, and notifications that are going to happen. Um, and I anticipate sending out my first blasts through this system um, in May. And if you're just getting an email, you'll just notice that the format looks a little bit different. The posts are a little bit nicer. Blackboard really didn't give us many options for that. So just coming soon to a theater near you. Um, HCC and BHHS facilities, I wanted you to know what's going on here right now. The Lumberyard Field SOD project is going to start happening in end of March, beginning of April. Um, and that is, um, we're excited about that. And that is, um, remember years ago, we received a donation from um, Armok Soccer, and we are applying that. Uh, one half went to the Wampus sod field, and the other half is going to Crittenden's. And that's at the lumber yard. Um, we will have conversations over time about the other field behind Crittenden, which is like the, mm. the Dust Bowl. Uh, we do have to have conversations about that in the coming years. We have to do something about that. But um, I, I don't think you can take sod, actually. I don't think you can grow anything there. And the high school uh, library and lecture hall planning. Um, we're sitting in this library circa 1978. <laughs> and the lecture hall across the hall circa 1956, I think, or 76 or something. Um, we have a committee, Andrew Taylor, Brian Horn, Caroline Matthew. I mean, we, uh, there are so many people on this committee. Um, Megan Salomo, Melissa Stahl, Michael Young, Chris Walsh, the APs, Letty Nardone. Um, there are so many teachers who have been on this committee. They have visited all of these schools that have had, well, some of them have, visited schools that have had library renovations already to get a sense of what we want. A teacher survey has gone out to see what types of things teachers need in a library. What are things that you can't do in your classroom that you would like to have kids be able to do in the library? Um, and so that another meeting is this Friday, and that's going to be a very long process um, in starting to see what the needs are and in a typical Byram Hills way. It's not that we 
plan to propose anything this spring. We're looking at, at next year to start still, to propose thinking. Do they still use the books? Like, yeah, they take books out. Yeah, they take books out. Yep. yep. Right over there, like you see on that little card, Mia? That, those are the books that need oh, to go good. back. I'm, and glad, I'm glad. I love books. I yes. just, yeah. I feel yeah. like everything's electronic now. It is interesting. And even um, in the town where I live, they now, next to the supermarket, put a pop-up library mm. affiliated with the town library mm -hmm. where they just have, like, you can go pick up books, you can order books to be delivered there, and they have books. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. I think the science journals are, at this point, almost all electronic. That's what they it. have to yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Will it journals. incorporate the new work we did over there? Yep. So it, it oh yeah, that's we'll keep that. Yep. Right. And then um, a new furnace coming in this week at the high school, and exciting softball field work that has been done. Really, it's not the softball field, but um, we do have a bona fide paved path to the softball field. Um, it's, oh, it's been done for this season? It's been done. Oh, wow. wow, that's great. And we are now in the process of trying to sort of tilt the seating so the seating's a little bit better over there, oh, too. Yeah. So um, it's time to bring people to visit you at their softball game and not worry that they're going to sprain an ankle on the side. Very exciting. Um, so library and lecture hall planning, back to that. Um, faculty survey meeting on Friday. And I just put this here because I thought it was interesting to see. Um, how many people wanted small group work? How many people wanted podcasting to occur? These were things that they couldn't do in the classroom. Um, some places for quiet reading. Somebody like, did you want it for testing? Meeting, oh, this is a great part. Meeting with somebody from a college, meeting with somebody from like science research, a mentor from Global Scholars, a mentor. So there, there are lots of possibilities between this room and the room next to it for kids to do that. Here are our COVID numbers since February 28th. Yay. So district cases requiring quarantine was zero, although we had six people who somehow in the past couple of weeks have gotten COVID. Um, and that those aren't big numbers. So I'm happy to see that because that's the post-vacation numbers. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's like great. business as usual numbers. It's great. <clears throat> and then the great student highlights, Science Olympiad, yay, they finished eighth among 20 schools and tried, I'm sorry, tied for 11th across 29 total teams. We had eight individual events in top 10 performances, and these are all of the middle school students who were a part of that. And I want to um, thank Dennis Covert, who has been helping that group. Um, he is a physics teacher at the high school. He was hired two years ago. Two years, two years ago. And um, it's just really, really invested in the school community. I mean, not only through extracurriculars, but go to any game and you will find Dennis Covert, <laughs> probably a member of his family that he's bringing to our That's school so too. Nice. So he really cares about our kids and was super excited about their successes. Ah, New York State Wrestling from February 26th. Mm -hmm. Our wrestler, Justin Fortuno, achieved Fifth rank, so congratulations to Justin. Justin, I wanted to have a parade with just you, but fifth, <laughs> fifth rank is like pretty, that's, that's unheard of, right? Unheard of. Congratulations. Really, congratulations. And a career 11 0 wins. What grade is he in? He's a senior. Congratulations to all of our athletic teams on fantastic seasons. And we had the semifinal boys varsity basketball game against Poughkeepsie on March 3rd. Uh, congratulations to Poughkeepsie on their win. I have to say that um, it was such a proud moment as a superintendent. At the end of the game, the Byram Hills players lined up and went over and were hugging the Poughkeepsie players, congratulating them. And, and it was like just a, you know, just real respect for the quality of the game and um, the, the amount of work that Poughkeepsie put into it. It wasn't really until the third end of the third quarter that Byron Hill started losing. Um, and that, I just thought that was incredibly impressive. It really was. Made me really proud to be superintendent. And written out loud, super, super fun. Uh, we, had a, we had a nice day there, Lara. We sure did. Generously granted by the Byron Hills Education Foundation, we had our students who are working collaboratively in eighth grade and they invited a member of the BHEF, uh, Jessica and Lara and I, to go and attend. Um, this one happened to be virtual, but the one that we were at was in person, and it was pretty amazing 
how they were getting kids to articulate their stories that will one day be put together into these books and bound. So just thanks to the BHEF because that was that's pretty awesome. Very and it's impressive. gonna continue on as a program here. Um, and Melissa and Janine are just off the charts. They're amazing uh, risk takers and uh, yeah. kids are finding their voice. In that they class. are. It, it was yeah. a, the investment of the students. Just li they were listening and you could hear a pin drop. Everybody was very respectful and encouraging of the stories. And it was a very, very wonderful day. Wonderful. Yeah. Collaborative wonderful skills they will use forever, right? Mm -hmm. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have a few things. Um, I'm going to give an update on the state tests. So the 338 tests are coming up. Um, you'll recall last year, New York State Education Department applied for a waiver from the federal government. Um, they did not feel it was appropriate to test kids last year given the pandemic. Uh, they were denied that. They did reduce the test to one day last year. Um, and then at the Regents exams, we only had one student take a Regents exam last year. It's one student in one, one exam. Not one, it's literally one student. <laughs> Our average was a 92. They did well. Um, but this year, it all seems to be normal with testing. Um, I've not heard that the state is modifying anything, so it will be the usual two days. I do want to remind our community that um, the state has made an effort to reduce testing. It went from three days to two days a few years back. They also implemented um, untimed tests for three through eight tests. So students can take as long as they need to finish the test. So it is an effort to try to make the test um, lower the stress and anxiety around that for our children. But these are the dates. Uh, students at Crittenden and Wampus will be receiving memos from the principals um, that outline the details of this. Um, so three through eight ELAs, March 29th to 30th. So that's coming up. The math tests are on April 26th and 7th. And then we have our science test coming up uh, in fourth grade, May 24th and 25th um, is the performance test, and June 6th, the written test, and then in eighth grade, June 2nd, and June 6th. So those will be taking place as normal this year, and they should be the usual two days. Have they given you any indication of when the scores come back? Is it going to be the same lag that it usually is? I'm sure it will be, yeah. <laughs> it's not longer just because of uh, the situation. Um, until we go to computer-based testing, and I'm not even sure then that it's that sped up because there's so many mechanisms that it has to go through um, in order to get the results validated. So I had a long conversation with the two folks who had the assessment department, and when they explained the process of why it takes so long, um, you know, they know it's an issue, but it's part of the, the bureaucracy of validating the scores. Yeah. yeah, I know. So hopefully someday we can move that up. But we're trying to get them feedback on how we can get to a better assessment system in New York. And I, we'll see if they take our feedback. You know how that goes. Well, through the School Board Association, we've, we've made the point around the turnaround time. And we also made the point that hopefully this year there are no repeat questions that are already circulated. Exactly ah. right. Yeah, there were some issues last year, too, that some of the items on the test were released items. So I think the state just threw together the test last year quickly. They were hoping to get the waivers. They didn't anticipate that they had the right to test. Yeah. Yeah. Um, advanced placement exams are coming up as well. Um, the administration this year will be paper and pencil, unless anything happens where they have to switch um, to you know schools being closed and go to electronic. But it seems to be on course to have the usual AT um, administration. Um, there are some That's changes. That's so interesting. Yeah. Like, really? Yeah. After all that, I know, right? <laughs> we're just going to go back to paper. Nothing has changed. With the AP exams, right. But they are making some changes to the SATs and PSAT exams. And right. so I'm wondering if that might happen in APs in the ah. future. Um, I think they do have some things to work out in terms of some glitches that occurred. Um, uh -huh. I think last year was better than the year before. Um, but they are making some changes to the PSAT mm -hmm. and SAT. So there will be a, tr a transition to digital exams um, so with the PSAT starting in the fall of 2023. And then in the spring of 2024 for the SAT, which will impact the, grade, uh, the graduating class of 2025. Is that your children? Are you laughing? I'm doing the math in my head. So it will be. In that transition, there will be some changes. There are some things that will remain the same. The same skills and knowledge will be tested. It's going to be the same uh, rating scale of 1,600. Um, it, you know, students can still take it in school or at a testing center, even though it's digital. Um, they can still, you know, they'll be doing it in school or at a testing center. And testing accommodations for those who uh, receive them will be given as well. Some things that will change include uh, a shorter administration time, going from a three-hour exam to a two-hour exam. 
uh, students testing on personal devices, computers, or iPads. Um, a faster score delivery for this, so students will get scores more quickly. Uh, the entire math section, students will be able to use calculators, and um, it seems like they're going to get more flexibility with administration dates. I don't know what that means yet, and they haven't given any details on that, but it seems like they might have some different uh, dates that students will be able to test. So they have information about um, like scrap paper, because math sometimes you need to yeah. work out your problems. Yeah, so I'm going to guess that you'll be able to have scrap paper and do your calculations as well, so we'll have to wait for the details. Um, this is sort of the high level changes that are recurring. And you can you go seen... back? Sometimes on these exams you can't go back. Yeah, that was a problem on the AP exams. Yeah. On the yeah. electronic AP. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, so those are all. Think of something like to be yeah. You know, and you yes. read something that jogs your mind and you couldn't go back. Yeah, those are all details that haven't been released yet. So that's something we'll be watching carefully and helping students understand those. I think for me as a test taker, you want to know going into it what you're able to do. So hopefully there'll be practice tests and things like that that students will be able to simulate what that experience is going to be like. Um, so I think that's... At oh. least by section to be able to go back. Yeah, right? exactly. Can I ask a question so, about regions because you didn't talk about yeah. regions. Are the, one, are the regions that students maybe last year in 8th grade and 9th and 10th, 8th through 12th grade that were waived last year, are there going to be other requirements, or are they completely waived? No, they were waived from the requirements, so they do not need to take those Regents exams for graduation. So if I was in Algebra 1 and I wasn't able to take the Regents exam last year, I do not have to take that Regents exam for graduation. You get credit for having completed the course. Do you still need to, like, wasn't there a requirement of two of this and one of that? Like, do you still Yeah, need no, you're just waived from it. So if... Then if you have to take your social studies, you'll still do that if you haven't sat in the course. So if you were in a course that ended in a Regents, that was a required Regents, you do not have to take that Regents exam. I know what you're saying. There's a certain number of Regents I'm saying like required those by kids course. who didn't take algebra, do they now have to take geometry nope. or trig or something else because no. they won't have the math region nope. at all? No, nope. you just, you get credit for that Regents yeah. exam. Um, if you had it's as if you took it. As if you took it yeah. by passing the course. So it was basically saying, and this is an interesting concept from the state, if you took the course and got a passing grade, you met the criteria of the course and don't have to take a culminating state test. Yeah. It's an interesting concept. <laughs> Maybe there's a future in that. Well, our finals um, are definitely more rigorous. Exactly right. And then I have one student highlight. So you remember in February, we had our Global Scholars team here, and they were getting ready for the global pitches for the students who were in year two. And you heard from some of the folks um, the, um, that were here presenting who actually were doing pitches. So this was our first year of doing this global pitch event by this organization called Changemaker Project. So students had to submit a two minute video to pitch their idea, their action project, and the goal is to get funding for their action project. And then once they actually do their action, they can submit and uh, be awarded additional prizes after that. So our students did that, and um, it was actually over the winter break when that event occurred. They submitted their videos, and then they were on a global Zoom meeting where people could ask them questions. And so we had some winners. So we had our um, dolphin hunt in Japan group, who you heard from in February, awesome. were top finalists in that pitch and got fully funded for their awesome. project. Wow. And um, Ellie Cooper, who was doing sustainability in tennis, and she talked extensively about her work, was the people's choice and also got funded for her project. And then one we didn't hear of that night, but Eleanor um, received funding and a mentorship for her uh, action project on epilepsy awareness. So I want to congratulate those students. We also had some additional students who uh, got grant funding as well for their pitches at this event. And that's Logan and Izzy and Amy and uh, Maya and Luke and Aiden. And then we have Sydney and the rest of the crew. I won't read all their names, but congratulations to these students. It was our first global pitch event and global scholars where kids were on a national stage and got asked some really great questions. Um, so some amazing projects as you see what students are doing. You heard about some of these when the students came to talk about it, but all these students uh, for our public who maybe didn't hear this before, our students can choose the project focus that they want to take action in. Uh, this occurs in the second year of the Global Scholars, 
team and then some students continue their projects in the senior year as well where they have to take action in some area. So you see these incredible areas that students are exploring and to listen to them talk about it with such passion. They do research in this area, they look at it from multiple perspectives, and then they come up with a way to address some issue through some action project. So really want to congratulate our students for the first time participating in this global, global uh, pitch event through the Changemaker Project. And, I was glad to see some of our students reward it. What stage of the program are most of these students in? Um, so I think a lot of them are probably... These are year two. Right? Yeah, year juniors. two students. So they're either juniors or could be some they have seniors. More, more exciting events. I think they're, all, I think they're all juniors, juniors there. Yeah, 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 I think most of them are juniors, right? That's great. Yeah, so it's the year two action awesome. project. That's great. Yeah, so congratulations to these students and to our Global Scholars teachers and administrators who work really hard with these students. We will post some of their pitches on our Global Scholars website. So really exciting, exciting to see. You did a great job. Yeah. So again, thanks to the board for supporting us. It's really been remarkable. Well, it was a great presentation. Yeah, thank you. And, we have a couple of weeks and that's all I have. All right. Anything, Kelly? Gina? Anything? Kelly's talked out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Budget time. Board report, I just have. Um, Two quick things. There's an upcoming um, school board, Westchester Project School Board Association school law workshop, and I think it's I'm almost positive virtual, right? I think it's virtual. And they tend to be very pragmatic and useful, and they update a lot of things that have changed. So if anybody's interested, you can sign up. And then we've had um, really a series of meetings at this point with probably everybody in the Westchester delegation, yes, we uh, <laughs> as well as others up at Albany. And some of the topics that we've talked a lot about are mandate relief, the EBUS legislation, um, regional cost index, trying to get you know, more money for this region given the cost of living here is, is higher than in, in many parts of the state, state testing um, improvements, and then on the federal level, um, you know, continuing to uh, have discussions on salt deduction. Those are just some of the, some of the quick highlights, but there's been a lot, of, a lot of discussions. Anybody else have any board reports? No? Okay. Um, so communications, item 14, um, one letter regarding masking that was received by the board. Anyone else have any communications? No. Nope. All right. So then we go to minutes. I get a motion to approve the February 8th and 16th minutes. So moved. Second. I have one edit, which let me just quickly, I wrote it down. It says that we posted a press release, that I said we posted a press release for the uh, board vacancy. But it's it's that the press picked it up. There was a press article. Oh. Okay. So that's just like a minor change. And I think it was on yeah, both sets true. of minutes. Yeah. So with that one change. But we um, did advertise it. Well, we put it on our website. Our website. Right. And it was at the public meeting and the press picked it up. Yeah. But it wasn't like a quote unquote like press release, that's all. Yep. So um, all in favor of the minutes? Okay. Anybody abstaining or opposed? Okay, cool. And now um, I would ask for a motion to adopt tonight's agenda to add a new item 16, which would be oath of office for Melissa Jacobs. Wow. So moved. Second. All in favor. All right. So come on up. <laughs> you're, you're the next contestant. Is my cheat sheet with me? Yes. Oh my gosh. Crazy Kelly. Yeah. Sorry, I, I have to uh, clean. I know. Okay. Just raise your right hand and just uh, read the statement as you've been doing. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitu Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Byram Hills School District Board of Education member for the remainder of the term, according to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank, Thank you for doing you. this. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. All right. Good night. Good night. It's only 9 o'clock. Well, don't, don't we have like a three-hour executive meeting? <laughs> <laughs>